on this episode of Sea Indonesia, we continue our journey into the depths of East Kalimantan. From high up in the trees at the Bangkirai Hill, to down in the waters below at the Bahakam Delta, to see the nature embedded within this beautiful province. Come and join us on our epic adventure. Come see the nature, only on Sea Indonesia. We began our adventure in the daylight hours of the afternoon in the remote hills north-northeast of Balikpapan. Right, here we are. This is Bukit Bangkirai and it's kind of like a campsite, a resort and an outbound area all packaged into one little place. When I say little, it is absolutely massive and we are completely surrounded by forests from all side. Around 500 hectares, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we can trek into the forest itself. So uh, let's see how it looks from inside, shall we? As it happened, as we were setting off, we ran into Mr. Amik, the manager of Bukit Bangkirai, who offered to take us to the canopy bridge himself. During our walk, he told us the story of how this area came to be. In the past, there once existed a 1,200 hectare forest in this area. Of that 1,200, 700 hectares were turned into rubber plantations, while the remaining 500, the area of which we were in, were turned into a conservation area. This conservation area can even be visited by tourists. And to make it even more special, they made a canopy bridge on top of the trees for visitors to be able to enjoy the view from above. areal yang cukup bagus eh, seluas tersebut sehingga eh, ada ide waktu itu ya selain dijadikan areal konservasi ada ide dibuatlah sebuah eh, kenopi break ini eh, dan diresmikan tanggal 14 Maret tahun 1998 disitulah akhirnya muncul dijadikan sebagai tempat wisata As the name of this location might suggest, the dominating species of tree in this forest is Bangkirai, also known as Sharia Lavis in Latin. And when they grow, boy do they grow to become giants. This is the, uh, what was the base of this tree that has now fallen. And it is absolutely massive, apparently. These kinds of uh, bangkirai trees can grow up to about 50 meters in height. And we're about to uh, climb one of it, so it should be quite interesting. Eventually, we reach the starting point of the canopy bridge. Here we are, finally, at the start of the canopy bridge. If you can see over there, we have the uh, entrance tower with an exit tower over there. And apparently we are going to be going up around 30 meters up the trees with uh, nothing but wood and rope to keep us 
uh, alive, really. Not gonna lie, I'm a little bit scared about going up there and about crossing the bridge. And we're gonna take a little bit of a risk as well, because we're gonna try to uh, fly the drone from up there, so we'll see how well it goes, eh? <sighs> so, up we went on the spiral stairs to the top of the canopy. Oh, let me just show you how tall it is. Look at that. Eventually, we reached the top where finally we crossed the bridge. Here we go. First, uh, first time I'm gonna get on the uh, the bridge. Ooh, this is scary. Ooh, okay. wasn't the only bridge that could be crossed. In fact, there was an even longer bridge which could take you to a lonely Bunkirai tree out in the distance. Okay, here we go. Ooh. Alrighty. Now, this bridge was probably the scariest of them all. And crossing it took forcing every muscle in my legs to continue forward. Boy, the view was absolutely worth it. Come take a look at this. <sighs> See what I mean? An absolutely stunning view of endless rainforest. And being on that platform made me feel small. Not in a bad way, but more because it helped to make me truly realize just how vast this forest was. And how absolutely, massively beautiful it was. But it also made me slightly sad. Sad that many beautiful forests similar to this one continue to shrink day by day. And yet, being here at Bukit Bangkirai also gave me hope. You see, this organization's effort to conserve this forest is continuous. And tourism into Bangkirai feeds into that as the revenue earned by it is used to maintain the area. In addition, people who visit are also invited to adopt the tree, a system in which the adopter pays a yearly sum of money to ensure their adopted tree remains protected. And so, with the support from tourism and tree adopters, the people who manage this forest hope that they can continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And so, after a moment to appreciate the view, we descended from the canopy and returned to the main grounds of Bukit Bangkirai, where we were planning to get some rest. Luckily, if we do need a place to stay, Bukit Bangkirai does provide some cottages and camps as well. Us personally, we got this one. This is the Levis Cottage, and it is quite quaint indeed. Let's take a look inside. Up these steps, take off my shoes on the terrace, which actually features a couple of chairs here where you can sit down and just kind of enjoy the view of the outside first. But there's an even better view over there, which I'll show you later. This is the living room, and it features these uh, two armchairs here, as well as this sofa and this table. 
which is all made of rot and I think very beautiful. And I've just realized the cushions match my, uh, match my shirt, don't they? <laughs> very nice. There's another shelf over there where you can store your things and a couple of jugs, which are also made of rotten. Meanwhile, the villa also provided a dining table which could seat for, made obviously from a beautiful rotten weave. Over here we have a dispenser and a fridge as well as a kettle. But these things don't work until around 6 uh, p.m. later in the evening because that's when the power comes on. So if you have a phone or a laptop or anything that you need to bring that's electronic, you won't be able to charge your phone until then. So you need to be a little efficient with it. Over here we have uh, the secondary bedroom as well as another bathroom in here and over here on this side there's a tv here we have the master bedroom which features this cute little vanity over here also made of rotten as well consisting of one shelf two shelves and another uh, little storage area here here is the bed it's a double bed there's a nice little lamp here as well, which we can turn on later in the night once the power comes on, as well as a wardrobe in here. Over here, meanwhile, is the bathroom, which has its own shower. Uh, another little tub there where you can take a shower with toilet. And they very kindly provided us with some soap as well. And here's the back balcony, which as you can see, does have quite an excellent view of its surroundings as well as a view of another uh, another lodge over there it's very cute we i look how we have this uh, little uh, pond here i think there might be some wildlife in there but i'm not sure exactly what kind of fish they must be quite small this uh, balcony also provides a little seating area where you can just chill maybe have a cup of coffee while you enjoy the nature that's outside with that, we rested for the rest of the evening. See the beauty only on Sea Indonesia. Early the next morning, we left Bukit Bangkirai with me personally feeling a sense of responsibility. And so, at the next destination, I wanted to take action. Do you know, being at Bukit Bangkirai yesterday really inspired me to want to take my own action, seeing all those people doing their parts to restore the forest. I wanted to do the same with the environment as well. And so I decided to come here. This is a fishing village in Muara Badak where we are going to go to the seas to restore some of the coral reefs in the area. Now we should be departing in about five minutes. So uh, I think it's about time that we uh, prepare our things, load them onto the boat and uh, get going, shall we? And so we boarded a boat owned by teacher and local coral reef restorer, Mr. Mansur, which, as it turned out, was... If you can hear the noise of the engine, it is quite loud. On top of that, it is kind of cloudy as well, so we're slightly worried about the weather, but hopefully it's going to remain okay <clears throat> throughout the day. Eventually, after 20 minutes of boating, we finally reached the coral reef. Right, we've uh, just about made it to where the reef is located. My ears are still kind of ringing from the sound of the um, boat engine, but uh, it's not too deep from what I see. And the water is not... Uh, uh, it's, quite, it's quite clear actually, so uh, 
let's get ready and jump in. And so I ready the scuba gear provided to us by Mr. Mansour, and together we headed into the water. Surprisingly for me, the waters were actually relatively clear. And so we were able to observe the underwater city that existed below. From the school of fish that went about their day, to the clownfish hidden amongst the anemone, this coral reef had everything you could hope for in a visit under the sea. And in the middle of the city laid a coral farm where Mr. Mansour did his work. First, he gathered zip ties on the seabed. then took a fragment of coral damaged by bomb fishing in the past and planted it on metal bars that were previously placed in the area. Mr. Mansur has been doing this coral transplantation for years. And as you can see, the results are already visible. And with the reef now teeming with life, it is on its way to becoming fully restored. The work, however, doesn't stop here. And for Mr. Mansour, this restoration effort will take decades to complete. After our dive at the coral reef, we were invited to dinner by the locals at a beach not far from where we went underwater. And after a short boat ride, we arrived at our destination. This is Pandrita Lopi Beach. This is kind of like a place a restaurant where we can eat uh, so many of the local foods some seafoods including perhaps some of the fish that we saw earlier during the dive and the concept of this is that we would be completely surrounded by mangroves on one side and the beach and the seas on the other as it happens however there was so much more we could do at Panrita Lobby other than eating in fact, this area is also a camping ground and festival location where every Friday and Saturday, concerts are held with local musicians performing for the audience. Today, however, we were here to have dinner on the beaches. Sadly, the weather had other ideas. As you can see, it started to uh, rain a little bit, but I can't help but just see the beauty in it, you know? I've been paying attention to the dew drops on the leaves and the trees, and they're just absolutely beautiful to behold. Look at that. And the lights hung atop the trees made the atmosphere absolutely magic cozy and even romantic. Eventually, however, the rain finally began to recede, which meant it was time to have our meal. That day, we were served prawn, fish soup, and crab. And I dug in 
and it was the best meal I had in East Kalimantan. With the fish and the prawns freshly caught, the smell and the taste were absolutely immaculate. The crab, however, was something else completely. It was only mildly spicy and slightly sweet, but very, very savory. And I just could not have enough. Mm. The crab is just amazing. It's insanely good. And to be eating here with this beautiful view, the trees and the beaches, I mean, there's nothing that beats it really. After our dinner, the clouds all but disappeared. So I decided to have a roam. And it was here while I walked around the beach that I realized how lucky I truly was. How I was able to visit all of these places from Bukit Bangkirai to the coral reef in Warabara to this beach in Banrita Lopi and places in the previous episode such as the Graha Indah Mangrove Center as well as Batua, where I tried live for the first time. All of these places are here now thanks to the grassroots efforts of locals who are passionate about the environment they live in. And, despite having little financial backing, have made monumental efforts to ensure that these places, the plants and animals living within, and the small communities who rely on them not only survive, but thrive. And for that, East Kalimantan truly is a special place. <laughs>